Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. I'm grateful that I serve under and serve with a pastor who prioritizes loving his family. And um, just he's always modeled that for me. I, I'll never forget. I, I think I have time to share this. I'll never forget uh, one of the first times I was ever meeting with him in his office. I was about to go to Portland, Oregon to work in a church out there. First Baptist was sending me and two other guys out to Oregon for the summer to work in a church. And uh, see, his phone's blowing up all the time. Texting, people are calling him, and he's ignoring every single phone call during this meeting. Finally, the phone rings, and he looks, and it's Miss Kathy. And he looks over at me and, and my buddy Eli, who was going with me, and he says, hang on one second. And he answers the phone and wasn't on there for 45 or so seconds and said, honey, I, I love you, but I'm in a meeting. I'm going to call you, call you right back as soon as I get out. And um, so he hung up the phone, put it down, and he kept on talking what he was saying. And then he just stopped and looked at me in the most serious way probably anyone other than my dad has ever looked at me. And he said these words. He says, when your wife calls you, you always answer the phone. And he just looks at me, and there's a long pause, and then he says, you got that? And I said, yes, sir. And then he kept on talking. It's, I, love that, I love that he prioritizes that. I love it. And I'm honored to, to step in for him today as he ministers and loves on his family and is just with them. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Let's read this together. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes this. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory is like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. I want to talk to us this morning kind of on this subject. Let the word work. Let the word work. Would you pray with me and then we'll dive in. Lord, I love you, and Father, I'm so honored and humbled um, to be on this stage behind this pulpit this morning. I thank you, Lord, for the example our pastor sets week in and week out for us. And Lord, it's just my honor to fill in for him any chance I can. And I thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you would use me in a way this morning that um, I could receive no glory for myself, but Father, you would use me. Spirit, I pray that you would guide my words, guide my thoughts, that I might communicate your truth and nothing but your truth. Lord, may our hearts be open to your word this morning. Lord, may may we come just as we just read with the understanding and the belief that your word is living, it's abiding, it's enduring, that has something for us today. And Father, may we be doers of your word and not just hearers. We love you. We love you, Lord, and we're so thankful for this morning that we have together. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. How many of you know that your actions don't just affect you? I, uh, you know, I think I'm learning. Uh, I've been married now for just a little over two years. My wife and I just celebrated two years. And uh, the more responsibility I get and the older I get, I think I'm learning the gravity of that even more. And in high school, I didn't really get that picture, right? I didn't really get that my actions really did affect other people around me. But, but as I'm getting older, I'm learning that it matters how I act and it matters how I treat other people, doesn't it? And, you know, Peter, as he's writing to these believers, he's writing to, as he says in verse 1, these chosen exiles, these people who are being persecuted for their faith. They're being persecuted for their love of Jesus and their commitment to living out the gospel. And they're being persecuted throughout the geographical region of Asia Minor. And they're being persecuted, and Peter writes to them to, really in a beautiful way, remind them of the living hope that they have in verse 3. That we as Christians don't have a normal hope, we have a living hope. Through through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He reminds them of that. He reminds them of the inheritance that they have that's kept in heaven for them. That's imperishable. That's undefiled. That's unfading. And he he encourages them in verses 13 through 17 to live a holy life. To prepare their minds for action. To live out in reverential fear. And as he gets to verse 22... He begins to shift the conversation to remind them, to encourage them, and to challenge them that living this Christian life does not mean that you just get to live in a bubble. 
That you don't get to just live as just a just one-on-one personal relationship with Jesus. And praise God that we have that. Amen. Praise God that we have a personal relationship with the Lord. But Peter is writing and says it matters how you interact with other people. It matters in the family and in the kingdom of God how you treat one another. So he's encouraging them here and he's challenging them to say as believers, as children of God, love for one another should be a defining characteristic in your life and in my life. Love for one another should be something that marks the believer. And he's encouraging with them with that in verse 22 and 23. I love how he starts off. He says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. Now, if you read your Bible slowly, that might pop up some what I like to call uh, theological red flags for a second. Because he says, having purified yourself by your obedience to the truth. Well, well what do we know that Romans 1.17 says? Romans 1.17 says the righteous shall live by what? Faith. Faith. Ephesians 2 says that we were dead in our sins. We've been made alive in Christ for it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. So we love the quote that it's not of works so that no man can boast. So what is Peter talking about to these people when he says you've purified yourselves by your obedience? Is is Peter rubbing against different scriptures here? I, I don't think he is. Because I think Peter is doing something that the New Testament writers often do. And it's something that I think if we're not careful, we we often do something that the New Testament writers don't do. And and what I mean by that, and this is just the perspective of a young pastor this morning. But as as I look at the church across our country in specific, uh, sometimes I often see us separating out faith and obedience. So sometimes if we're not careful, I think we can separate out faith and obedience where we say with our lips, I love God, where, where we say with our mouth and we give lip service to Jesus that I love him, that I, that I want to serve him, that I am, am thankful for him and I place my faith in him. But yet when we actually walk out in our life, the obedience of our life does not match the words that leave our mouth at all. Where if we're not careful, we separate the two, faith and obedience. And I'm just here to tell you, I don't think the word separates out faith and obedience. That that if you have, go read James chapter 2, right? That if you have faith, if your faith is in God, then your faith without works is dead. Are you saved by works? No. But faith is always and should be always accompanied by works. Amen? Um, I love Hebrews 11, where it's the great hall of faith, right? Because we're Christians are corny sometimes, and we name chapters of the Bible, weird things like the hall of faith, the hall of fame. You ever heard of this? And you have the hall of faith, right? And there's incredible men and women of God who've done all these things by this incredible faith. And I love Noah, because what does it say? It says, by faith, Noah built. By, By faith, Noah hears the word of God, right? He hears the word of God that the flood is going to come. And what does it say? That Noah built. I I love what my good friend says. He says that faith don't float, right? Noah Noah can believe in his heart all he wants, but what does his faith do? His faith produces obedience in him to actually do what the Lord says. I I love this shouldn't be foreign to us, right? Obedience shouldn't scare us because what does Jesus say in John chapter 14? Jesus says this in John 14, 15. He, He says, if you love me, if you love me, you will keep my commands, So a good test for us this morning is if we love Jesus, if we say we love Jesus with our mouth, then a good test for us is do we do what this word says? Do we live like Jesus? And so Peter here, I don't think Peter at all would disagree with the statement that we've been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I don't think Peter would disagree with that at all. He's just writing to these Christians and saying that their faith has been purified by their obedience to what they are professing to believe. But here specifically, he's writing about a specific truth, isn't he? I mean, he says in verse 22, having purified yourselves by obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. He's saying you are doing a good job of having this love for one another because love for one another is something the Bible commands us to do, isn't it? I mean, what does Jesus say? These words strike me when Jesus says this in John 13, 35. He says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. Isn't it pretty crazy that Jesus doesn't say that people will know that you're my disciples by how well you raise your hands in church? Because some people are really good at hand raising in church and some people look kind of awkward. You know, hey, just me. You know what I'm saying? I look awkward too. So I got the, I love, you ever seen Tim Hawkins talk about raising hands in church? I got the heartburn a lot of times, you know, put my hand on my chest a little bit. Some people know what they're doing. 
Jesus says, you're not going to know who my disciples are by that way. He says, you're not going to know who my disciples are by how much money they give. He doesn't say, you're not going to know how my disciples are by how much time they spend in church and what they do there. Jesus says that the world around us is going to know that we really belong to him by the way that we love one another. So Peter is writing this, and look at his encouragement at the end of verse 22. He says, you've purified yourselves by your obedience, but then the command comes at the end when he says to love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So they've been loving one another, and they've been doing that, but Peter is encouraging them to continue in that love. And and I hope, I think one of the best things you can do is read your Bible slowly. You, You ever read it sometimes, and you read through in like five minutes, and you get done, and you put it down, and immediately you think, what did I just read? (laughs) And you can't even remember it five seconds later. I think one of the best things we can do sometimes is read our Bible slowly because as we read verse 22, what we immediately see jump off the page is that this kind of love is not just any normal kind of love. But just in these few short words, there is four modifiers that Peter gives to this love just in this one verse. The first one is that it says it's a sincere love. You see that in verse 22. He says, to your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. This love that we're to have for one another should be sincere. This love that we should have for one another should not be fake. Do you ever know um, the people that tell you they love you all the time and they're the first to say that they love you, that yet every time you call them, they never answer the phone and they're never there for you? Right? And it's like, man, you, you say you love me, but every time I need you, they're, they're nowhere to be found. But Peter says our love, for that, our love for one another should not be in that way. That our love for one another should be sincere. So someone doesn't look and say, man, that's just the love that gives lip service. Or that, that's just the love that's fake. But it's a love that's sincere for one another. That's genuine. That's not counterfeit. Peter says that's the love you should kind of have. But he doesn't only just say sincere. What does he also say? It's a brotherly love. He says that in verse 22, having uh, uh, purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. You you know, my sister was in the first service, and I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, I love my sister in a different way than I love you. (laughs) I hope you're okay with me saying that, right? I mean, family ties are just a little different, aren't they? Like, I, I love my sister. You don't talk junk about my sister. I just, she, I can talk junk about her sometimes because she drives me crazy. Um, (laughs) But you don't talk about it. I mean, I love my sister. But can I tell you how the Lord began to work on my heart? Studying this passage and studying what does Peter mean by this brotherly love. Here's what I think he's calling us to. Is that you and I in the body of Christ, we are not to love one another as if we are brothers and sisters. But we're to love one another because we are brothers and sisters. Do you see how there's a different viewpoint when you think about it that way? That I don't walk into a church service on Sunday morning looking around and saying, man, I'm going to love these people as if they are. No, no, you are my brother and my sister. What, what does Jesus say in John chapter 1? Or the word say in John chapter 1? It says, but to all who did receive him, who all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So I got news for you this morning. If you are in Christ, and I'm in Christ, then you are my brother, you are my sister. So I'm called to love you, not as if you're my brother and sister, but because you are my brother and sister. The reason I left that in my notes about my sister, because I wanted to take it out, to be honest with you, because I, I wrote that in there, and I was like, that'll be a nice little segue. But, but the more the, the Lord worked in my heart, I began to think, you know what, I should love you the way that I love my sister. I should love you. I mean, what does Jesus do in Mark chapter 3? Remember when Jesus is doing ministry and Jesus' mother and his brothers come up and they think they're going to kind of get preferential treatment, right? Because they're the family, right? They think Jesus is going to stop for them. What what does Jesus say? He looks around at the people and says, this is my mother. And, And these are my brothers. And what does he say? Whoever does the will of the father, whoever does the will of my father, these are my brothers and sisters. Can I I tell you, if we really begin to see one another in that way, if we begin to see one another not as if we were brothers and sisters, but because we are brothers and sisters, that changes the way we talk about one another a little bit, doesn't it? That that changes, maybe maybe this is a more permanent one, that changes the way we talk about one another. You know what it also changes? It also changes the way I respond when I hear someone talk about my brother. So I'm telling you what, if you come up and talk trash about my sister, I don't want to hear it. 
I just, I just don't. She might have done you wrong, and I'll say, hey, let's go talk to her one-on-one, and let's handle that together. But that's my brother. That's my sister. And so I'm not going to engage in talking behind someone's back because family members don't do that to one another. That's what Peter's calling us to here. That it's not just a normal love. It's a love that's sincere. It's not fake. It's genuine. It's a love that's a brotherly love. And then look at what he says when he gets to the command. Love one another earnestly. Earnestly, man, this, this word it kind of messes with me because this means that I'm not supposed to just kind of love you. I'm supposed to really love you. You know, and this is where I struggle with this as a youth pastor because I love our students here like 99.9% of the time. But man, you, you go to a summer camp with us and you get to night four of camp and you've been sleep deprived all week and you're ready to go to sleep and some high school boys are like playing Lord knows what in the room beside you and you're yelling. And I mean, you just, it's hard to love them in that moment. I'm just being honest with you, right? But yet Peter calls us here to this love that's earnest for one another. This love that says, even if you're acting like a fool sometimes, I'm still going to put up with you and I'm going to love you. Now, what I don't think he's saying is I don't think he's saying in all of this that this is a love that's absent of conflict. You know, sometimes the most loving thing I can do for you is to pull you aside and say, man, that way that you acted, that way that you responded, it is not the way that God's word would have you respond. It's not the way that Jesus is calling you to live. And I love you. You're my brother. You're my sister. I love you enough to maybe put some strain on the relationship here because Jesus has called you to more than that. And I want to walk. I want you to walk in all that he's called you to walk in. So sometimes earnest love looks like I'm going to be willing to put myself in a situation like that because I want to see you walk with Jesus more closely. But it's a love that's never fractured. It's a love that's never ended and cut off. It says, man, I earnestly love you. But it's not just sincere. It's not just brotherly. It's not just earnestly. Look at the final one. This is the one that, that shakes me the most. He says, to love one another earnestly from a pure heart. You know, oftentimes what I got to watch myself doing is I can love someone with sincerity. I, I can love someone because they are my brother and my sister. I can love someone earnestly, but my motives be false. You know, because if I'm not careful, if I love you, because of what you can do for me or the benefit of what you can give me, then I'm really not loving you because in loving you, I'm actually just loving me because I want to get what I can get out of it. Is that about you tracking with me? This kind of love says, man, there's no strings attached. This kind of love that says whether you write a check for offering every week that's huge or whether you can only give a few pennies, we love you. I tell you, this is where this has been really challenging me as a youth pastor because, man, I should love the student that comes into our youth ministry nine out of ten weeks. I should love them just as much as I love the one that comes one out of every ten. That I should love the one who maybe just comes and sits on the back row. I should love them just as much as the one who wants to get involved and is ready. It's love that comes from a pure heart because I'm not expecting anything in return. I just, I just love you because you're my brother. You're my sister. And so if you can't do anything for me at the moment, that's okay because that's not why I'm loving you in the first place. I'm loving you from a pure heart. Do y'all feel the weight of this love? I don't know about you, but I do. Because when I begin to take this test and say, man, am I loving with sincerity? Am I loving as you're my brother or my sister in Christ? Am I loving earnestly? Am I loving from a pure heart? That's a hard test to pass, isn't it? I'll never forget, I had a job in high school. I worked at Lily's Auction right across the, the highway over here, right before we get to the railroad tracks. And um, one thing you need to know about me is I'm not handy at all. Like, I, I feel like I can talk in front of people a little bit, and I like sports and stuff, but, like, when it comes to, like, fixing stuff, I have no clue. Um, a couple weeks ago, I changed the headlight in my Highlander and thought I was a mechanic. I was like... <laughs> Man, I, I watched a YouTube video, I did it, accomplished it, it was great. And uh, working at Lily's auction, Jed Lily was, was my boss. And Jed was a great boss, and I, I loved working for him. But he was, really, <laughs> he was really bad at telling me to go fix something and do something, and I had no idea what I was doing. So if you ever bought something for him and it fell apart when you got home, that might have been me. Because oftentimes, oftentimes what he'd do is we'd get a dresser that maybe had a mirror attached or something. And we would detach the mirror and move it into the auction house and stuff. And we'd get there and he'd say, okay, Justin, I'm going to go work on this. I need you to go take care of this and put this mirror back on this dresser. And in my head, I'm thinking, okay, that's not bad. Like just mirror on, whatever, not a big deal. But then I actually walk up to it and I get there and I look at the nuts and the bolts and the screwdriver and the mirror. And I'm like, man, this is a little bit harder than I thought it was going to be. You ever had those things when someone tells you to do something and you're like, oh, that's easy. Then you get to the project and you're like, man, I'm not cut out for this. 
Okay, can I tell you, that's kind of the way I feel as I'm reading this passage a little bit. Because, you know, if Peter would have just said to love one another, if that's all he would have said, like, you know, like no adjectives, no modifiers, nothing. If he had just said, hey, love one another, I'd have walked away and been like, man, okay, maybe we can possibly do that. I, I, that might be kind of attainable, loving one another, absolutely. But then he throws in the modifiers that it's supposed to be sincere, that, that it's supposed to be earnest, that it's supposed to be brotherly, that it's supposed to come from a pure heart. And I don't know about you, but I don't see that that often. I always see myself falling short of that standard. I, I'm striving to be there, but it makes me ask the question, Peter, is this kind of love even attainable? Because let's just be real. This is not a kind of love that we see in the world, is it? I, I mean, we see in the world, if you look around, we see a love that has contingencies. We see love that has expectations. We see love that says, if you don't meet up to what I need, then I'll just stop loving you. We don't see, it kind of means, brings a little bit more light to Jesus' words when he says that you will know me by the way you love one another, right? That you'll know you're my disciples by the way that you love one another because people, think about this, people should be walking by First Baptist and maybe a guest is here this morning. It's my prayer that they walk in and say, man, that music was awesome and the preaching was okay, but you know what? Those people, they love one another. This love is different, and it makes us ask the question, man, is this kind of love even attainable for the believer? And I love what Peter does, because it's almost like Peter foresees our objection. It's almost like for Peter foresees us even asking that question. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I love what Peter's about to do, because he's about to remind us that it is indeed possible to have this kind of love. Because what does he say in verse 23? He says, since you have been born Again, P Peter says, if you're in Christ, something has happened to you. If you're in Christ, you met Jesus and something changed inside of you. I mean, Ezekiel prophesied correctly in Ezekiel eleven nineteen, 19, where it says that God is going to give his people a new heart. That the 2 Corinthians 5, 17 is right when it says that in Christ, the old is gone and the new has come. But Peter is saying, if you are in Christ, you've been born again. Something has changed inside of you. Something has been regenerated. When you placed your faith in God through the death and resurrection of Christ, the Holy Spirit began to work in you. And what used to not be able to achieve this kind of love is now attainable since you have been born again. That God has done something inside of me. That the God has done something inside of you, that the Holy Spirit has changed yours and mine heart. And this love is not only something that's attainable, but it's something that we should strive for since we have been born again. And, and I love Peter here because Peter's got a little preacher in him. And, and what I mean by that, have you ever heard a preacher, and you might have already felt this way this morning, but have you ever heard a preacher that he just starts talking and he just can't help himself and he gets excited? I've never done that, ever, <laughs> ever. You know what, can I, I got time, I'll share. Uh, last year, the Lord broke me of that because I used to kind of be a little cautious about how excited I'd get and used to be a little weird. And then uh, it was during the Panther game last year against the Saints on Monday Night Football. I mean, my dad are at the stadium and all of a sudden my phone starts blowing up and, and I'm looking, I'm like, what's going on? And I'm getting text after text because one of the Monday Night Football cameras caught me um, cheering for the Panthers. It's around the stage. So I, I watched the clip. And I'm up in my seat, banging the seat behind me, screaming my lungs out. And guess what? We were terrible last year. <laughs> it's not even like it was the playoffs. Like, I'm just cheering my guts. Out. And I'm telling you, it's funny how the Lord will use stuff. Because the Lord said, you get excited about that? Why can't you get excited about the word a little bit? Why, 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 why? Uh, I'm off script. I'm sorry. Why, why, why do I have a fear of clapping my hands? But yes, yeah, sometimes watching those games yesterday, we're clapping and jumping and screaming up and down. And the Lord says, you can get excited about that. Man, it's okay to get carried away just a little bit sometimes, isn't it? And I love Peter. He's got some preacher in him, man, because he starts, and it's almost like he can't stop. Because he reminds us, he says, you've been born again. And he could have left it at that. He could have just said, love one another with sincerity and earnestly and all these things. He could have just said that and said, because you've been born again. But it's almost like Peter has to keep on going and remind these people how it is that they've been born again. It's almost like he just can't help himself. And he says, I got to remind my people something. Because look at what he says. He says, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, not of something that's just here for a moment and then gone. 
Now, not of something that looks great for a while, but will eventually collect dust and die. He says you've been born again, not of something perishable, but he says of something imperishable. Something that will never fade. Something that will never dry out. And what is that imperishable seed? Peter says it's through the living and abiding word of God. That the word is this imperishable seed. And read John chapter 3. When the spirit of God and the word of God work in conjunction to bring this new life about. Peter says that's what you've been born again by. And man, he starts talking about the word. And I'm telling you, it's like he can't help himself because he, he starts talking about the word and his mind goes back to Isaiah 40. And he begins to quote Isaiah 40 in verse 24. And listen to what he says. He says, all flesh is like grass. It's kind of an intimidating thought for us, maybe a humbling thought for us this morning. Because, you know, the prettiest grass, it looks beautiful and it's nice and green and lush. But the smallest child in this room can walk out to that grass and pluck some up in their hand, can't they? Grass is great for a second, but it's here and then it's gone. Well, the Bible says that all flesh is like that. He says all flesh is like grass and all of its glory is like the flower of the grass. Can I just remind you this morning, you can attain glory on this earth. You, you can. I mean, you can set school records. You, you can climb the corporate ladder. You, you can make a ton of money. You can be as popular as possible. You can have the most impressive resume. You can attain glory on this earth. But the problem is that Peter says the glory is like the flowers of the grass. Where, where one spring, it looks awesome and it looks beautiful. But then a few short seasons go by and that field looks completely different, doesn't it? That you can attain glory, but the problem is it's just here for a second and then it's gone. Because what does Peter say? He says the grass withers and the flowers fall. Now, let me tell you, your achievements will wither and your glory will fall. Your, your records will wither and your bank account will fall. There is nothing in this fading world that we can accumulate that will last forever. But in the midst of this fading world, Peter stands up and says, we have something that's not like everything else. We have something that endures forever. Because Peter says that the grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. That the word of the Lord remains forever. This is how I'm trying to tell it to you. You ready? Genesis was written 3,000 years ago, but it's still telling us that God is going to redeem the humanity that sinned against him. Exodus is written long ago, but it's still shouting to us that God can save his people from bondage. Leviticus, written long ago, is still pointing us to the Lamb of God that would be slain for us. Numbers is old, but it's still reminding us that although the people of God can be dumb sometimes, God will continue to lead his people. Deuteronomy is still telling us that through the test of time, it's declaring that God is faithful. Joshua is still telling you and I that God is going to bring his people into all that he promised them. Judges is still telling us that while we might struggle with being faithful to God, God will never be unfaithful to his people. Ruth is still telling Telling us that when I could not redeem myself, I have someone who steps in to redeem me. First and second Kings is still telling us that earthly kings just won't cut it and we need a better king and it points us to King Jesus. Nehemiah is still telling us that God can do miraculous things through obedient servants. Esther is still telling us that even when it seems like God is not working, he is at work. Job is still telling us that God is really all that we need. Psalm is still singing to us that the Lord is our song through every season of life. Proverbs, that he is the only wisdom that we truly need. Ecclesiastes, that he is really all that matters. Lamentations, that his mercy is new every morning. Ezekiel, that he can still make dead things come alive. And Daniel, that he will not abandon his people in exile. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Here's what I'm to, the newspaper this morning is already outdated. The presence that you got Wednesday will collect dust and die. We live in a fading world. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but this word endures forever. Forever. This world is fading. This world is falling, but God's word endures forever. And I love what he says. He says, in this word, 
is the good news that was preached to you. You want to be encouraged, go through the book of Acts and just read some of the sermons that the apostles preached. Read the sermon in Acts chapter 2 when Peter gets up and preaches. And can I just say this? If anyone ever had a reason to stand up at a pulpit and preach his own personal experience, it was Peter. If anyone ever had a reason to just stand up and just say, man, this is what, because listen, he saw Jesus live. He saw Jesus die. He saw Jesus be buried. He saw Jesus resurrected. He saw Jesus being ascended. But Peter laces and crown foundations his sermon in the Old Testament. Peter preaches the word, doesn't he? He proclaims the word. Why? Because the grass withers and the flowers fall. But this word... Oh, this word endures forever. It's a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. It's living. It's abiding. It endures forever. Now, here's the deal. We can clap to that. We can get excited about that. And I know I just did. I'm sorry. We, we can do all those things. But why don't we run to it more often? Can I tell you what would be really awkward is uh, for lunch, if, um, if I go to La Unica, which is probably where we're going to go, but I got news for you. You're not, you're not invited because I invited at 8 o'clock, and that place is small. So I love you, but I'll, I'll see you next week, okay? Um, I'm just kidding. How awkward would it be if I got there and you disobeyed me and came, and you get there, and you see me, and I say, hey, what's up? And we sit down at the table across from you. And I order my crazy burrito with steak because that's what I always get, and I order it. And it comes to the table, and I get there, and we bless the food. And my beautiful wife, she leans over, she grabs my fork and my knife, and she begins to cut up my burrito and then spoon feed me. You'd be, I'm just telling you, listen, it looks weird when a fully capable man has to be fed like that, doesn't it? I gotta ask, I wonder how many of us fall into the rut so often that we are just fed this word on a Sunday morning? Well, you probably have a copy this morning. You probably got a phone that has it. What if I, what if I move? Because I tell you, and I'm not trying to be higher than you, because you know what rut I often fall into is I, I only go to the word through seasons of my life when I'm doing sermon prep. And man, I want to be a person of the word where, man, I just love Jesus' word and I love it and I don't need to prepare a sermon. I just want to go to just be filled up and just be encouraged. What would it look like in your life, in my life, if instead of running to other people first, instead of running to other things first, to articles or whatever we run to, what if we ran to this word? Can I tell you, fathers in this room, mothers in this room, the best thing you can do for your family, one of the best, is prioritize a love for this word. I loved walking in on my mom every now and then when she was sitting at her bedside table reading God's word. I don't know what she was reading, and she never explained it to me, but I loved watching, walking in and just watching her soak up this word. It's living. It's, a, it's about, you say, Justin, how is it living? You ever walked into church, and you're like, how did preacher Mike know what was going on in my life? He didn't know it, but God did. It's, living, it's just as living tomorrow. As it, you, you realize that this word is just as living on Monday through Saturday as it is on Sunday. What, what would it look like? if we let this word work in our life. I thought about naming this sermon the, the best thing you can do in 2020, but I thought that was kind of corny. But one of the best things that you and I can do in 2020 is immerse ourselves in this word. Because you say, Justin, we've come a long way from, from loving one another. That's where we started off with this. And I just gotta be honest with you. I wanted to just preach verse 24. I was just going to read that one verse and we are just going to hang out there. But I couldn't get away from the fact how Peter runs to verse 24 in the context of telling believers to love one another. It happens in the same thought, doesn't it? Because you know what? If you run to this word, my students in here maybe are a little shocked and I say the best thing you can do is run to this word because we always tell our students we point them to Jesus because we believe that Jesus is better than anything else the world has to offer. So they're like, okay, well, Justin, you say run to Jesus, but run to the word. Can I tell you who you're going to run slap dab into when you get in this word? <laughs> you're running to Jesus, man. And when you run to this word, you're going to find someone who loved you with so much sincerity. 
You're, you're going to find someone who loved you as a brother and sister to adopt you into his family. You're, you're going to find someone who loved you so earnestly that even though you were rebelling against him, he died for you. You're going to find someone who loves with such a pure heart to give glory to his father. You get in this word, you're going to run straight into Jesus. Would you let this word work in your life? If that love seems unattainable to you, that intense love, man, would you get in this word and let just the Holy Spirit use his word? Jay, I love you, brother. And I love how you, so many times you encouraged me through this word. And so many times you just sat out there and just spoke scripture over my life. And it blessed me so much. Would you just immerse yourself into it? Dive into it. Because the grass withers. And the flowers fall but the word of the Lord endures forever. It endures forever. So immerse yourself into it. Immerse yourself into it. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord, we love you. Oh, and Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. Lord, I thank you that your word is living. It is abiding. Lord, the gospel has been being preached for 2,000 years now and it's still just as fresh today as it was yesterday. Oh, I thank you for that. Lord, I pray that we would move to a place in our life where we just place an incredible value on your word. Father, I pray that in this room we'd be challenged, Lord, to just immerse ourselves into it. Father, the, the things that it calls us to, it, it, it's tough. That, that kind of love is intense and that love is... Is heavy, but Father, your word has done a work in our heart. Holy Spirit, you, you've used the word of God to do an incredible work in our hearts to make that love attainable and possible. And Lord, I pray, I pray that we'd be a people who just dive into your word. I pray for fathers and mothers in this room to set that standard in their home, to, to raise up children and teenagers and people who love your word, who love it. Because Lord, it is living, it is enduring. It is never fading. Lord, I thank you that in the midst of a world that is constantly fading, where we see things that are constantly falling away, where we have something that endures forever. And Lord, I thank you for that. May we be a people who, are, who immerse ourselves into it. Lord, and allow the word to work in our life. Lord, we love you. We love you this morning. In your name we pray. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.